people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with war torn Afghanistan where a rapidly deteriorating human rights situation has prompted the United Nations to appeal to the international community to aid and assist. Out of $41 billion, it asked for people suffering in poverty in conflict across different countries. A major portion, it said, was required in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, keeping a track of what is unfolding in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime, the UN has denied its entry in the global group. Out of $41 billion required to provide life-saving assistance next year to a record 183 million people worldwide caught up in conflict and poverty, Afghanistan requires the most. The United Nations has observed in its latest assessment of the situation in the war-ravaged country. In Afghanistan, more than 24 million people require life-saving assistance to prevent catastrophe, a dramatic increase driven by political tumult, repeated economic shocks and the severe food insecurity caused by the worst drought in 27 years. The UN says it has tripled its efforts in the country following the Taliban's capture of power and the subsequent downfall in the human rights situation in the country. We never left Afghanistan and we're there now with a projected program for 2022 three times, three times the size of the program for 2021 because of the various needs and circumstances that you know so well. Meanwhile, the World Bank's board has backed transferring $280 million from a frozen trust fund to two aid agencies to help Afghanistan cope with the brewing humanitarian crisis. Now, it requires 31 donors to the World Bank-administered Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund to approve the transfer before the funds could flow to the World Food Programme and UNICEF. And while it could come as a breather to an increasingly desperate Afghan dispensation, one UN committee has given a major blow to the Taliban after it deferred its decision on giving recognition to Taliban in the global body. The nine-member UN Credentials Committee, which includes Russia, China and the United States, met at UN headquarters to consider the credentials of all 193 members for the current session of the UN General Assembly. Hence, Suhail Shaheen, who has been the global face for the Taliban, might not be able to represent the Taliban in the UN. While some say the decision has been influenced by Washington, the Taliban has urged the US to stick to Doha dialogue and urged it to release funds for a proper functioning of the country. They discussed all those matters which are of interest to both sides, including the removal of uh, members of uh, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan from the blacklist and also from the fries list. We uh, discussed that the implementation of the Doha Agreement is a solution for all issues that we are facing because uh, in that agreement, uh, if it is implemented, uh, normalization of uh, our relations, uh, removal of uh, the blacklist, reconstruction of Afghanistan, investment of American side in 
the marine mineral resources of Afghanistan and uh, in other fields uh, can be achieved. So our request is uh, that the Doha agreement uh, be implemented. The situation of Afghanistan has turned from bad to worse, where the security of girls, their education, employment and economics are in doldrums. Facing mounting global pressure, the Taliban have for now said they will allow older girls to resume classes once arrangements are made to ensure they can do so in conformity with what the movement considers proper Islamic standards. However, this doesn't seem to be materializing on ground. Even the most regarded Turk schools in Kabul, where hundreds of students took exams recently, were forced to toe the Taliban line. They have had to make changes to their curriculum, shutting music, theatre and dance departments. Observers therefore say the Taliban promises for now are hollow as they haven't changed a bit on crown for the welfare of women, children, or by and large, the welfare of the country. Moving on. Indian authorities have scrambled to take measures against the rising threat of new COVID variant Omicron. While the country has already detected two of its first cases, the authorities say they are more cautious and prepared for the challenges the variant brings along with it. The experts have urged to impose strict measures in order to maintain the continuous decline in cases that India has achieved after intensive vaccination drive. As India reports two of its first Omicron positive cases, authorities have scrambled to take a host of measures to contain the spread and maintain the progress they have achieved with the vaccination drive in past few months after the second wave in April and May. Apart from tracing contacts of the two, the government has launched standard operating protocol at airports and other transits to check a sudden rise in infections. जितने उनके प्राइमरी कांटेक्ट्स हैं और जितने सेकेंडरी कांटेक्ट हैं उन सबको ट्रेस कर लिया गया है और उन सब की टेस्टिंग करके उनको एस पर प्रोटोकॉल हम कोऑर्डिनेट कर रहे हैं। As soon as the World Health Organization declared Omicron a variant of concern, the government has revised the testing guidelines with a specific focus on countries identified at risk. In coherence with the calls made by international experts, including the WHO of not putting a blanket ban on international travels, India is now testing and closely monitoring everybody who has arrived from different country. Mandatory tests, quarantine and isolation is going to be the norm for at least next few days. International arrivals uh, countries go at risk और कंट्रीज अदर देन एट रिस्क बताया गया है जिसमें एट रिस्क कंट्री से जो लोग आ रहे हैं उनको 100% चेकिंग करके सैंपलिंग एंड टेस्टिंग करने के बाद ही यहां से एयरपोर्ट से बाहर जाने की अनुमति दी गई है While India has managed to vaccinate over 80% of its 944 million eligible adult population, the experts say it must further ramp up its drive in order to secure a certain level of immunity in citizens against the new variant. Although there have been reports that Omicron might escape the immunity, experts have urged people to not grow pessimistic and keep vaccinating themselves. Indian Council of Medical Research has even backed the domestically developed co-vaccine for being effective against the Omicron too. Experts have also urged the government to further step up testing so that virus can be detected, decoded and contained at early stage. We have to speed up our testing, we have to increase the number of testing so that uh, at early stage we can detect the, if 
if this virus enters into our country, we can detect it at very early stage. As of now, this new variant with a spike protein dramatically different from the one existing coronavirus that vaccines are based on has raised global alarms and frightened financial markets. And while other South Asian countries might not have reported Omicron cases, the countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan have been faltering at testing and vaccination since the beginning. And as per the experts, including the global health experts, it is these countries that are at more risk than others of Omicron, and it is them who needs to be more careful. Moving on. In yet another testament to the robust bilateral relationship between India and Nepal, Kathmandu has unveiled its first shock table testing facility in Lalitpur with Indian assistance. The country was devastated by an earthquake in 2015 in which around 9,000 people were killed and 600,000 structures were damaged. This facility not only adds to the joint endeavours undertaken by New Delhi and Kathmandu towards infrastructure development of the Himalayan nation but will also boost the morale of natives of the region who have been living in a severe intensity seismic zone. In a first in the country, a shock table testing facility has provided a shot in the arm to the earthquake preparedness of Nepal. Built with assistance from India and the United Nations Development Programme, the facility at Tribhuvan University Institute of Engineering will help the nation in building homes in the regions that are vulnerable to seismic activities. The facility will also enhance Nepal's research and academic capabilities towards constructing safe buildings. The government says the facility comes in line with the major steps being taken to protect the fundamental interests of right to life of people living in the vulnerable areas. <laughs> The government of India engaged several international organizations with the project in March 2018 to provide socio-technical facilitation and consultation services to 50,000 earthquake-affected households. The shock table testing facility is expected to be instrumental in identifying appropriate retrofitting technologies that will be needed to make Nepal's traditional houses safer and resilient. Indian side says they are happy to share the technology and assist one of its closest allies in this major task that will help people retrofit their homes instead of rebuilding them in entirety. The purpose of GY housing project was not only reconstruction of earthquake damaged houses but also creating a repository of information, technology transfer and research activities. During the implementation of this project, it was felt that a number of affected people preferred to retrofit their house instead of building a new house. For retrofitting, it was essential to test the seismic performance of alternative retrofitting solutions. For this purpose, UNDP, with the support from Government of India, has built this shock table facility in the premises of this institute in collaboration with DUDBC and the Ministry of Urban Development. As of September 2020, 211,985 resilient houses out of the project target of 335,700 have been reconstructed across 32 districts where the 2015 earthquake had severely damaged people's shelters and homes.
while millions of dollars flowed in under international assistance to provide rehabilitation to thousands who were rendered homeless post-disaster, the Indian contribution in rebuilding exercise has been instrumental. As part of the reconstruction process initiated after the 2015 mega earthquake, over 50,000 private houses have been constructed in Gorkha and Nuwakot with Indian aid only. New Delhi, which is involved at several developmental fronts with Nepal, including those of developing railways and laying of gas lines among many, has committed to assist Kathmandu at all levels in order to provide additional impetus to the decade-old partnership between the two. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. European, Iranian and Russian diplomats sounded upbeat as Iran and world powers held their first talks in five months. The meeting in Vienna ended a long hiatus triggered by the election in June of Ibrahim Raisi, an anti-Western hardliner. The talks are effectively indirect negotiations between Tehran and Washington, with other officials shuttling between them. The Islamic Republic's top negotiator, Ali Bagheri Kani demanded the removal of all US and European Union sanctions imposed since 2017. He also said that the United States and its Western allies should offer guarantees that no new sanctions would be imposed in the future. Meanwhile, Israel PM Naftali Bennett expressed worries saying Iran will secure a windfall in sanctions relief in renewed nuclear negotiations with world powers but will not sufficiently roll back projects with bomb-making potential. Israel, which is not a party to the talks, opposed the original 2015 pact as too limited in scope and duration. Israeli leaders have long threatened military action against Iran if they deem diplomacy a dead end for denying it nuclear weaponry. Japan and the United States could not stand by if China attacked Taiwan, and Beijing needs to understand this, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said in a virtual forum organized by Taiwanese think tank, the Institute for National Policy Research. Abe said the Senkaku Islands, which China calls Deu Islands, Sakishima Islands and Yunaguni Islands, are a mere 100 km or so away from Taiwan. An armed invasion of Taiwan would be a grave danger to Japan. Tensions over Chinese claimed Taiwan have risen as President Xi Jinping seeks to assert his country's sovereignty claims against the democratically ruled island. Taiwan's government says it wants peace but will defend itself if needed. Soy sauce is a universal seasoning loved by one and all. Kikkoman, a leading soy sauce company based in Japan, is dominating the global market. It functions quite similarly to Japanese traditional food culture and ensures the natural brewing of soy sauce. Kikkoman sells Japan's unique soy sauce as an all-purpose seasoning. In 1957, Kikkoman entered the US market. Currently, it is operating in more than 100 locations around the world. Kikkoman advertised soy sauce's all-purpose seasoning in a TV commercial aimed at attracting viewers and emphasized the strategy of promoting soy sauce in local areas for consumers to actually know the taste of soy sauce. The company's motive is to make good quality soy sauce which is consumed by many people all across the world. Made by natural methods, Kikkoman soy sauce is a quality product used in a variety of dishes. The geothermal electric power plant at Oyasu region in Akita prefecture has been set up for operation by Ide Mitsu Kosan, a company known for specializing in gas station operation. Geothermal energy is attracting attention across the world. Ide Mitsu operates gas stations and also develops geothermal energy in Japan. Searching for geothermal energy stored in deep underground consumes a lot of time and money, but Ide Mitsu Kosan continuously tries to develop clean energy.
Moving on. Spectacular fairs and festivals add another component to the civilizational heritage of India. And one festival that tries to encapsulate all cultures around the country is the vibrant India International Trade Fair. The trade fair, which is renowned for being the world's largest fair, was recently held in capital New Delhi after the COVID-induced one-year gap. National and international exhibitors participated in this mega fair, making a unique display altogether. Have a look. Ridzi pavilions, enthusiastic visitors and unique items from across the world. This is the India International Trade Fair. It is the largest unified trade fair with business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer components. Every year, it is organized by India Trade Promotion Organization, a nodal agency of the Indian government for promoting countries' exports. Held after a year's gap due to COVID-19 pandemic, this year too, the initial four days of the 14-day event were opened only for business visitors and after the general public were also allowed to visit. Thousands of traders participated in the event. The fair brings the finest crafts and authentic delicacies from different parts of the world in one complex. Visitors can also get a glimpse of the rich culture of various Indian states at their respective pavilions. ट्रेड फेयर का इस बार हम लोगों ने सुना था कि दो साल कोरोना की वजह से आ नहीं पाए थे तो इस बार काफ़ी एक्साइटमेंट थी आने के लिए तो देखा कि क्लीन है पहले से बहुत काफ़ी अच्छी मैनेजमेंट है बेटर है द थीम दिस ईयर वॉज आत्मनिर्भर भारत और सेल्फ रिलायंट इंडिया वेर ऑल स्टेट्स गवर्नमेंट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड अदर स्टेक होल्डर्स फुट दे बेस्ट फोर्ट फॉरवर्ड Artisans from different corners of India put their stalls here, enabling visitors to buy exquisite pieces of handicraft and handloom products like carpets, bamboo items, jewelries, and lamps. The fair also provides small artisans a platform to reach out to a larger number of consumers. Like every year, the International Pavilion at the Trade Fair also witnessed a huge footfall this time. this time it's uh, i could see a lot of improvement because the entire infrastructure is really good but yes since it's a uh, covid period is on so we weren't expecting much of the international uh, participants but it's okay at least india they are promoting india they are promoting the uh, indian culture that is the best part like we see lot number of indian stalls here people from rajasthan uttar pradesh everybody is here so definitely india is doing good Hunar Hat organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs acted as a major crowd puller. IITF is one of the biggest fair and a major tourist attraction. Ranging from the felt items of Bangladesh to the traditional carpets and dry fruits of Afghanistan, the pavilion had much more that attracted one and all. Some of the exhibitors have been coming to India for over a decade now and they firmly believe that the trade fair has opened the gates for them to a larger market. Trade fair is not just a point of exhibition and attraction but thousands visited for business too. With that we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.